All right, man. It's a uh, gloomy Thursday morning, but I couldn't feel better. Oh, good. That's good to hear, man. It's a beautiful day here in Overland Park, Kansas. It's August 25th, 2022. Welcome aboard, everybody. You're listening to the Crushing Iron Podcast. This is episode 611. 611, man. Just keep showing up twice a week. Keep showing up. That's all it is, man. Keep showing up. Some of a, you know, people continuously ask, like, hey, what are you doing? Or what do you got going on? I should the podcast. How was it? Eh, six, 6.5 out of 10. Pretty much our standard. You know, some sometimes you guys love them. Sometimes I'm sure we could uh, need improvement. But for the most part, they're just solid, consistent, and uh, you can and dependable because we do it. We do it twice a week and have for what, going on six years. So it's been a while and uh, we love it. We'll keep doing it. First time tuning in. Welcome. We appreciate you giving us your time. You know, you have a lot of options in the triathlon podcast universe and just podcasts in general. Your time is very valuable. So we appreciate you tuning in today. Uh, we cover it all. We will do swim, bike and run specific podcasts. We'll do race recaps. We'll also do race previews like today. Uh, but for the most part, Mike and I as coaches, athletes, best friends we just sit back relax have an open honest discussion about what we're going through as human beings on this planet but also coaches and athletes ourselves Uh, we'll also talk a lot about what our athletes are going through mike and i both work with a wide range of athletes all across the globe from beginner level athletes looking to their very first 5k and sprint all the way up through elite level amateurs trying to get back to kona and everyone in between so we'll use the communications we have with them in training peaks Uh, text messages, emails, phone calls, uh, Zooms to uh, drive the topic of the day and use their experiences to kind of to uh, share with you with the masses and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes, but also learn a lot of the lessons that they learn along the way in their journey. Uh, We also go into our Facebook group and we utilize that. You can search that crushing iron group, answer one simple question. We'll let you right in. It's been uh, a swinging door lately. Had a lot of people coming in uh, the last few weeks, I'm not sure what the cause is, um, but it's a good thing. We, we're always looking for and uh, welcoming awesome new people to our community. Uh, more is always better when you can surround yourself with uh, positive people that are have lots of information and knowledge to provide, answer any of your questions. So it is. It's, it's a great place. It's a safe place um, to ask questions and, and get great answers because, um, we listen, we're all still trying to figure this sport out, and we will until the day we quit. Uh, it is a confusing uh, sport and one that you're always trying to pursue something better, get faster, go longer. It's just a lot. So the more you can, uh, the more help you can get, the better. So we have uh, uh, that community, and sometimes we we'll go in there and do a Q and A. Um, that's it. We don't do sponsors, we don't do ads, but we do have an agenda, and that's to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey. Yeah, which is evidently what we've been because. Uh... That's almost six years of podcasts without a, a week of red. It's all green, baby. You know, I have never thought of it that way, but you're, you're exactly right. I mean, we, we've aimed low with only two, but that's technically aiming very high uh, because I think most most podcasts do like once a week or maybe every other week. But yeah, it's a, twice a week. I mean, listen, we might not be the greatest, the latest, or have the uh, most spectacular people to interview, but... We just show up and you can at least depend on the fact that we'll be there and you can always open up your little podcast queue and find a new episode of the Crushing Iron podcast. But yeah, 6 uh, six eleven's a lot. We're uh, turning and burning, but we love it. Um, and one of the races that kind of got us going in this this whole journey is we've kind of chronicled over the last 600 plus, but also I think most recently I talked a lot about Wisconsin. Ironman Wisconsin's coming up. The 70.3 is coming up. Uh, you're doing the full. I'm doing the 70.3, but it is kind of the uh, – it's a special place for both of us. It was your, it was your first full. I was up there. I've spectated it, I think, three or four times now. You spectated it. I think you've probably been, what, every year since you did it the first year? If you weren't competing, you were there. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe just one year. I mean, I can't, I can't think of a year that you've actually not been up there – since the first year you went up there to actually, uh, you went up there and did it in what, 2013? Yeah. I was trying to think about 12, right? No, uh, 13. Yeah. I've been to every one since then, either spectating or racing. I think this would be my fourth time doing it, but I was always up there spectating. I think I have videos for most of the year, just sort of tribute videos that I shot and walking around and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, obviously my favorite race, but, uh, um, I'm looking forward to it. 
Yeah, it's a it, listen. It's a special place. If you've never been, put it on your list. Um, it, it traditionally sold out all the you know super early, like a lot of the events, but sold out again this year. Lost a little bit of its luster since they've gone away from the mass starts, but since they're both going to be up there, it's a course that we're very, very familiar with, and it's one of the next uh, full distance races. Obviously, you got Ironman Canada this weekend, but we honestly don't know quite enough about that course to give you a nice, informed, uh, well thought out podcast. So instead of uh, under delivering and uh, over promising, we're going to do the opposite today and give you everything that we can um, to prepare you for the full and also the half. The last year they did the full and the half on the same day, which it, I wasn't a huge fan of. I was spectating. You were racing. Um, I'm really, really glad that they separated the two events. I feel like it took a lot away from the 70.3 athletes, but also the full athletes. Um, I thought that they caused a lot of confusion on the swim and made it kind of a cluster uh, in a lot of ways. So I was very, very happy to see one that most of you might not remember, but they had moved this race originally back to, no, I say back, but to June. Um, and I think that was a conflict with Ironman Des Moines, what they wanted to have or Des Moines 70.3. And, uh, that lasted. And I'll be honest, I kind of joked when I saw like, you know, sign this petition to move, you know, Ironman Wisconsin back to September. Um, and I'm like, okay, that stuff never works, but it worked. It worked. Uh, (laughs) It worked. And it seemed like it was a very, very easy. It's just, it's, it's, it's Madison in September. It's football. It's a farmer's market. It's it's the temperature. It's everything you associate with this event and the wonderful city that it is. Um, it's a special place. So again, you know, we'll go in and we'll start it off here in a minute and do the the race preview and kind of walk you through the um, the city itself and athlete check in and then the and the pre race swim and stuff you can do um, and then get into the race course. But it is if it's not on your list, it should be. It's one of our team races next year. It's just it's uh, it should always be. It's a great event. It's been around forever. And, and the city really does the city and the community of Madison. It is one of the, it's one of the few courses and cities that you hear that even when people come up there and you've you mentioned this to me off air and, and, um, in multiple, m- multiple times this summer is how awesome it is to go up and pre ride the course and how welcoming the everyone is obviously you're going to always going to have you know somebody who's not super happy but heading out into verona and getting your loops in you're always going to see people out there and so of all the courses that you can get up and go pre-ride take some weekends experience the the course itself i would say it's probably one of if not the best in north america for that yeah they've they've worked really hard on that i think they've you know had a whole neighborhood group that goes out and talks to neighbors and stuff like that and gives them cookies and things like that so yeah i think the the community has embraced it the roads are um they've picked roads that aren't super busy and i think that definitely helps you know but i'm sure some pe- people get frustrated i always thought that's kind of why they wanted to move it to June was to get all those rides all summer out of the way. But, um, mm-hmm. as it turned out, yeah, I'm so glad they moved it back because honestly that was like ruining one of, I, as far as I can see, one of the best races out there because you know, it's just that I think the ride in the course thing is a big part of that race. It's not the race obviously, but you get out there and I think a lot of people really, you can't really ride it much before June. So, it would kind of take that whole thing away and then what, you know, you're going to ride it all summer and then not do the race till next June. That seems kind of weird. So, uh, I'm really glad they moved it back and I certainly wouldn't have done it even though there's something, you know, enticing about doing it early in the year to get it out of the way or whatever, but there's nothing better than that. I, I knock on wood, but I think every year I've been up there, the weather has been almost perfect. I mean, it was a little chilly one time, but I mean, that's just it, you know, it's going to be in the sixties, seventies and eighties. And, you know, it's been a little chilly up here too. So I'm, I think the, you know, it's always wetsuit legal for people and which I think a lot of us like. Um, so yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great place. I mean, I obviously brag about it a lot and it's kind of cool to hear you talk about it because you're not from there, but you get to visit and it's sort of like me hyping Knoxville back in the day. You know, I love Knoxville. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It is. It's at the. It's it's just a very very cool. I mean, I I generally like college towns anyway. Um, I think they have just a very unique feel. Um, and it's just it's a really really cool college town. So yeah, it's a it's a great place, great event. Hopefully you can get up there early. Uh, you can start checking in on Thursday and walk your way down to. And again, another reason I'm a huge fan, similar to you, is it is a park it and leave it race. Yeah. If you, if, if you want it to be, it is a park it and leave it. 
race. And so we always go our, our preferred hotel. We get no discounts, but we do love it. It's the best Western Inn in the park right there uh, downtown, uh, right around the Capitol. Uh, you can start checking in on Thursday. Walk your uh, walk your happy butt down to Mono Terrace. A friendly reminder, Thursday and Friday, that's it. There is no check-in on Saturday unless you have uh, preferential treatment. One, because the 70.3 is that day, but two, they, they've really never allowed that. And I, I've always fascinated that people seem to just not understand that. Um, that they're like not coming until Saturday. And like it, it specifically says on the athlete uh, schedule, there is no check-in on Saturday. So don't be, don't be shocked when that happens. Uh, but they've got, uh, you'll have the check-in in Monona Terrace. Um, and then they'll do the, the athlete briefings and the ballrooms, which I believe, I know last year it was a little bit different. And then the, the year before it was, as, uh, it didn't happen. But I think they are back doing the, um, the transition area for the full uh, at least inside the ballrooms, if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, which I think is a, a it's it was again one of the cooler events that, to be a part of. Um, you're gonna have a pro race field this year, which is awesome. Uh, you got males and females, which I think is also the first time they've had male that they had a male only a, a male pro uh, year, and then they had a female only year. But this year it's both, and there's actually some pretty solid names on both ends, so that'll be exciting. Um, but really, it's just a um, it, it's a really exciting uh, city to be around. Get there early, experience it. Um, one of the other things that I love about the, the the centrally located aspect of it is that you can stay in a hotel, you can walk to athlete briefings, you can walk to check your bike in, you can walk around the expo, and you can also walk your butt to the swim start uh, and check and check things out and look around and. Um, and get kind of a view of the race. You can stand on top of uh, Monona Terrace and look out, look at the entire swim course. It's not as daunting as it used to be because it used to be one loop. We'll talk about the swim course here in a minute, but it used to be one loop and it was back in the mass start days for the full. It's now two uh, and it goes the opposite direction, which yeah. I find a little bit interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it is also one of the, I think one of the best full distance course. I think Lake Placid is the same where you can feel very safe getting out there Thursday, Friday, this year they have the 70.3 obviously going on the day before, but then after the 70.3, you'd have to imagine that the buoys they'll just leave out. Um, and you can get out there for a pre-race swim. Highly recommend doing that. You've got the, the river walk or the greenway, whatever you want to go, the bike path down there as well to get a few bikes and runs, but it's a, it's, it's also a great place to get some rides and runs and obviously get in the water and get your open water swim. So you're ready for race day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, um, Two loop swim, I guess it is what it is. I, and it's not crazy about it, especially since uh, I was thinking, well, first of all, I got, I think I was the last one to sign up for that race. Maybe. I mean, Glenn texted me the other day. He goes, man, you might've been the last one to sign up. I had no idea, but I thought since it was full, full, they might actually bring the whole course back, but evidently, well, I guess we don't know, probably won't, but uh, for me, it's going to help because the buoys will be on the right. And that's a good thing for my breathing, but. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I mean, because that, that was the thing about that course to me was it, it is a tough one, man. And, uh, you know, it can really get in your head a little bit, the full course, that long, long stretch on the other side. But um, I kind of wanted to conquer it, but it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to do that. Just like I'm not going to be able to conquer a mass start. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, – but, yeah, I definitely I definitely recommend it because I've swam there a couple times this summer <clears> – <throat> And I think it's good to get out there and, and feel that water because it's it's interesting because it all kind of breaks into the Monona Terrace. There's a concrete wall that runs along there, and I think it creates some pretty big chop. So it'll be on the stretch coming toward back towards swim start that it gets a mm -hmm. little janky in there sometimes. And I, I was on a kayak a couple times last. It was two summers ago. The, the year they canceled it, we went up there and did a simulation thing and. I was out there in a kayak, man. I was scared to death. <laughs> it was just chopping. Like I was hanging out by that wall and it, that, the, you know, the waves come in and bounce and then they come back and it creates a whole different element there. So, I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm probably overstating it. It can get really, it usually gets really rough right after the swim, I've noticed. I've been up there watching yep. so many years and then by the time everybody gets out of there and people are on the bike, I look over there and I'm like, Jesus. You know, so usually in the morning, it's not too bad, but it's still definitely choppy. So you might want to, at least get a feel for the water out there. Yeah, I would I would highly recommend getting in Friday, Saturday after the 70.3 goes off and just get a feel for it. The buoys are going to be out. Uh, you know, I remember the very first day we got there, Hayden was like seven weeks old. I walked to the top of Monona, uh, Monona Terrace. 
looked out and I was like, good Lord, that seems like a long way back when it was just back when it was like one loop. I feel like it went all the way down to the very end. It basically did. And they cut across and came all the way back. But I do. I, I think that the, the two loop swim has honestly made it more difficult. I know that it's not a mass start. I know that it's not going all the way out and come back in. But I do think it makes it more choppier when you, anytime you slam 2,500 or 3,000 people in a more condensed area, two loops, and you're kind of keeping them pretty close to shore, which is also why I think it's it's a little bit harder to navigate, right? It doesn't, it doesn't run like, you know, uh, straight along the shoreline you're in the capital city trail with the with the concrete walls and stuff so you can kind of get off course because if you assume it just runs kind of parallel to the um to the trail you might think oh, i think i'm pretty close i'm going and then you look to your left and you're like oh i am i'm a little bit i'm a little bit off course here um it is more advantageous most more people than not breed to the right so i do think that's better uh, again the directions they have with the, the buoys now is swimming with keeping the buoys to your to your right, but it is a it is an interesting uh, it it does present problems, and I think the two loop again. If you look at how long it's probably going to take people to get in the water, um, I remember spectating it the first yacht last year, and and obviously that had something to do with the seventy point three, but mostly it was also the full. Is that if you're one of the first people to get in the water, and you you know it, it's it, there's a really weird spot here, and as a coach, you you have to kind of go with your gut here and what you tell people because your first loop, right? If you're starting your first loop and you're a fast swimmer, you're going to get in the water um, at race time. One of the first people in, let's say it takes you 26, right? 28 minutes, 30 minutes to get on the first loop. You're going to be starting your next loop, basically and being an F1 car trying to swerve around 18 wheelers, right? Just trying to weave in and out of some of the slower swimmers that have started 35, 40 minutes, behind you mm -hmm. so your second lap is 100 percent going to be slower than your first lap just go ahead and understand that go ahead and realize that be okay with it no issue whatsoever just know what's going to happen uh, last year i was honestly surprised at how much longer they were how much longer athletes were out there for the second split some of them were i think five to ten minutes slower in the second loop so i do feel like there's a happy medium kind of sweet spot in that you could start the race maybe so the gun goes off at seven you you wait to get in the water till 7 30 right and you've let kind of the some of the fat a lot of the faster swimmers kind of come up and 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 already make their way through and then you're kind of going in unpeated a little bit of traffic in the first loop but maybe even less traffic on the second because of 30 <laughs> minutes of athletes have gone before you so I, I do think there's a sweet spot there i'm not going to do the math and try and guess what's gonna be the, the biggest sweet spot but get in the water early again like you said it can be choppy it can be intimidating i think it was maybe not last year but the two years before that it was really really choppy it was one of the harder swims that I think the athletes that we had that raced it said they had done. Um, it's I've never had the sun be a problem in that in that race just because of of how close it is to the um, uh, shoreline and out that they have you breathe into the right. The only time you would ever really get anything is when you're way back in. So wouldn't worry too much about the the sun, but the, the be prepared for the chop. It is traditionally wetsuit legal, um, so definitely pack it. Uh, and I'm not sure what the water tip is right now, but. I can't remember if it's ever not been wetsuit legal. So it is one of those where you, you should anticipate wearing a wetsuit. Um, so make sure you're comfortable in that. If you haven't been in your wetsuit, you know, all year, because it's been so freaking hot, you know, then make sure you get in uh, the water ahead of time and definitely make sure you get in the water Thursday or Friday before, even for 10 minutes, you know, get in your wetsuit, get in the water, get comfortable, get used to the environment and get ready to have a great swim. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think it ever has not been wetsuit legal. And, um, but as you're, that sweet spot thing is interesting to me because I was thinking about, is it like, uh, cause I can't remember exactly how long it took. And I, I think with a sellout, you know, you don't know, like, I don't know what that means anymore. Is that 2,700 or 25 or what are they doing? You have any idea? I, I, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the participant list. I would say it's probably got to be somewhere around 2,500. Yeah. So you're talking 45 minutes to get everybody in 35. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was thinking about that too. <laughs> it's interesting. You say like you could maybe wait a half hour because yeah, you look at last year, the, you know, I know this is all kind of relative, but the splits from some of the people getting out to that first, because I think they have the timing arch or whatever way out at the furthest point. And some, I looked at, the, you know, the pace, meter pace, and some people were like 115 pace out to that first one. And then the second lap, they were like 
138 pace, you know, so yeah, it went way down. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, you know, you're further into the race too, but, um, yeah, it's interesting you think about that sweet spot. Cause I was trying to think about, man, you know, even if somebody like me, like got, if you waited 15, 20 minutes or seven minutes, I don't know what the you know thing is. It, it, I guess it all depends on how long they get people in the water, but right. it, it, it's definitely one of those things where you kind of, you, know, you probably can overthink it. You know, you might want to just go and just <laughs> have clean water the first uh, loop and yeah, you know, it's it's a lot, dude. It's a lot to consider. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things you should you should consider and be thoughtful of uh, when considering, you know, your your level of comfort with contact, right? Like just just kind of looking back at one of our athletes who swam a 104 there last year, second and, and second in their age group. Um, the first split was like 3.7. She was a 113, and then the 1.9 split was a 138, and then and and then the last version of the swim was a 222 for an overall split of 140. Obviously the 0.7 split is just off from a, from a distance standpoint. I think the, the 1.9 split was a little more uh, accurate. That's about the level of time she swims, but still a lot, um, a lot slower on the way back in. So I, I do think it, it, it bears something to pay attention to, um, is to, is to understand and be like, Hey, listen, do I, do I wait? You know, cause one of the reasons we always waited to be the one of the last ones in the Louisville was because, you know, you got that slingshot, mm -hmm. right? You got to, if you're a faster swimmer, it's not, it's not as congested, right? It's not, it's not a, it's not a two loop. It was just a straight shot. You go out through the channel you make it, you make a U-turn, you go straight back in much less, uh, of a kind of a, a navigationally challenging type swim, a lot less technical than this one, but you, you basically, you know, let 2000, 25, 3000 people in front of you, do their swim you have little to no contact because of how wide it is and again it's just it's just one it's it's point to point not two loops and then you get that slingshot free draft right come in um, you know kind of bunny hopping come in come out come in come out wisconsin's not like that right it, it, it's not it's not it's, it's a more difficult challenging course but then again as much as you want to say hey i'd like to buffer myself out a little bit make my second loop a little more comfortable the water is only as busy as the 20 feet around you. <laughs> so, so you could, you know, it, no matter what, you're going to be surrounded by people. And then I also think and this goes to the 70.3 as well as we're going to move through the transition. The transition takes a longer time. It's a more, it's probably one of the most technical transitions that you're going to find out there. You come out of the water. And again, if you've never been there and you've never been to a full distance race, the energy right there on the lawn and at the, the helix on the terrace the morning of is e electric. Mm -hmm. I get chills every time we're down there. I get kind of amped up. I'm like, why can't it register right now? Like, which again, huge mistake on Ironman's part. It's not open up registration at the swim start with the music bumping here, <laughs> register right now. button, 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 swipe, just button. You know, they would, so they'd sell out on point for people who've never even owned a bike before, but it's, <laughs> you'll come out, of, you'll, you'll come out of the water. It's, it's that good. You'll come out of the water. You'll run up, the helix, which is again, if you're looking for to, to break some PRs in your transition, look elsewhere. This is not it. You can take your wetsuit off. They'll have wetsuit strippers. Uh, sit on your ass. Let your wetsuit get ripped off you. Run up the helix into the ballroom. Uh, it is a long run up, and it's obviously straight uphill. But you will have people on both sides cheering you on, yelling like crazy, and it's awesome. Uh, but it does it does take a while. You'll go through uh, into the ballrooms. You get changed. Go out and get your bike. Head on the course. The one thing I would say, and kind of going back to the swim and kind of where you place yourself is, I do think there's something to be said in getting out onto this course. Uh, one, because of how crowded the helix can become going down the hill. We, we all know that triathletes are not so famous for their impeccable bike handling and ability to use brakes. Uh, but also for the amount of time you stay on the Capital City bike trail, starting off before you get on the roads, it is narrow. You can't go nearly as fast. It can be congested. So that's that's kind of the, the caveat I would give to trying to pace yourself maybe a little bit further back uh, out on the swim is how congested it can be um, at the beginning of that bike course. Yeah, and I've faced that congestion getting out of there right in the middle, like with everybody, and it's tough. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but my thing with the swim is like sometimes it, you know, I get it. You got to be real. I think you're going to have to be real comfortable with your swim if you want to get out there and get out front because for me – 
I'm always worried about going out too hard anyway. And then when you get around faster swimmers and everything, you're probably just subconsciously trying to go a little or going a little faster without realizing it. So it is, mm-hmm. it's a, it's like, I have that dilemma every time I get to a, you know, swim start in the morning. I'm like, man, I want to get out front, but I need a little bit more time maybe to just let this thing unfold. And that's when I feel more comfortable is when I, I can, I, I go when I'm ready. You know, it usually comes down to that. It's like, well, at some point you got to go just get your ass in the water. But um, I try to start in at least the first third of it, I guess. And maybe that'll be the sweet spot and I'll be lucky. But yeah, that that bike path thing, too, is a good you can't pass. um, I don't know how far Mm -hmm. it is, but they have a no passing zone for the first. There's a few miles in there. And that's probably a good thing for most people just to force you. Some people go. (laughs) Well, some people just pass you on the grass or something is ridiculous sometimes. Mm -hmm. But. But yeah, it's a good, uh, it's a good, like get warm, get, you know, get used to eat some stuff and get ready and fuel up and and then you can get out to that uh, stick, man. Which I think it's the same. I I heard it was different last year, but I don't remember. I was, I I heard it with the stick was a little bit changed last year, but I could be wrong. If if it, if it was, if it was different, it was like one of the unnoticeable changes, not like, you know, the three bitches or three sisters, whatever you want to call them. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think the while the bike path, you know, listen, if you're doing this course, you're not here to shatter a PR anyway, right? L- unless you've done this course over and over and over and over again, it's your repeatable course. It's a tough course. It's a tough day. The, the bike course, because of its hills, its rollers, how things are, this, what I think is 50 plus turns, not just for the for the full, but the 70.3 has, I think, 50 turns as well. Um, they moved the 70.3. It's a different course this year. Uh, I've heard it's great, pretty good payment, but some rough patches, but it's just a lot of turns. Um, but I, I do think while, again, while the bike path to start can be aggravating or frustrating for most people, if you take it for what it is, it's good for you. Uh, give you a chance to kind of get your breath, right? Catch your breath, get your legs loose. Don't be in a hurry. Get some fluid in you. Slow yourself down, right? <clears throat> You're not going to win your race on the bike path. You're just not. <laughs> You're not going to win in the bike, but even though you will see like, you know, the 25 to 55 year old men flying by doing bunny hops over the grass all on your left. And they're coming up, you know, on the right. It's always dudes in a freaking hurry. Um, and then you end up seeing them walking in the back half of the run. Anyway, head on the bike path and you do, you come out and I, I think it's a, what I love about the stick and what I love about the course in general is it doesn't just kind of get you right into the meat of the course immediately. You got the bike path. You got the listen. We're not going to call that. We're not going to call any part of this course flat uh, because I just don't feel like it is. But you do have the first little bit that's not nearly as technical. Uh, the first what, maybe 10, 12 miles before you get out to or 18 miles to so get out to the stick. Uh-huh. Then things get then things get technical, right? It's a um, it is a challenging course in a lot of different ways. It's um, it rewards those that pace properly, that have good bike handling skills, that know how to use their gears, um, and it's laid out well. You you've done it again a lot of times. I've, we've coached a bunch of athletes that have done it. I've done it once. What are some of your biggest tips on conquering this bike course? <clears throat> well, I think one of the biggest tips that I have is it's interesting because the the three bitches, the hills that get all the acclaim, are in the second part of the loop, <clears throat> and. Uh, that's always kind of pegged as the hard part, the hardest part. I think you can't underestimate the first half of that loop. It's uh, for me, I think it's actually a little bit tougher and I've been up there riding it um, several times since the last time I I raced. And um, I think it's usually slower. Um, The first, you know, 15 miles up to Mount Horeb, that long climb. and, And there's, there's a bunch of Hills before you get there. Um, it's a little tricky because I think you're, if you're watching your speed, you might be like, damn, I don't know. You know, we got the hard part coming up, but I think there's, I think a lot of it is because of there's the really fast downhills on the second part of the loop too. So, um, I would say just be careful, uh, as you're getting going, because you're going to think, uh, all right, well, the hard part, the big hills are at the end, but there's some, there's a lot of hills before that, you know, you got that um, section that I think is the most beautiful section on that bike course with that. <clears throat> there's those three rollers where you go through the, the, um, farm fields and you can kind of see the whole length. It's probably, a, you know, a couple, couple miles or so. 
And you, it's just so awesome, man. It's like it's the roller coaster section. I can't remember the road right offhand. Is it? I'm not even going to say it, but um, like you get that's right after Mount Horeb. So that's not an, a tough or an easy part either. So you got that and then you get through that and then you get to Garfont, Garfont Road or whatever. And that's like a super mm-hmm. big bomber. And you get, I mean, you know, just you can get some really good speed coming around that. And uh, there's some turns in there and just be careful. But like I've done that hill this summer and gone down it and you can coast like, I don't know if you remember where they turned us off for that Barlow that one year when they, um, yep. like you go down a big bomber when you go down that thing and that thing will carry you, man. So if you control yourself and use that speed really well, there's some really nice downhills that you can make up for the slow climbing stuff. So that's to me is, is one of the biggest takeaways though. I think is that the first part of that loop, even though it's not, you know, pegged as a, the hardest, I think it is a little slower, but you know, I don't know. No, I, I totally agree. And, and looking like looking back at some of the, the power files that, that athletes have done, it, you brought up a great point that I think people oftentimes miss when they think about attacking this course is they think, Oh, the three sisters got each loop. But if you condense it right till you take the miles up until you do the very first one of the, what they call, you know, the three sisters <clears throat> you do, you start at the mile where that one starts and then you cap it at your end of your second loop, uh, the second I'm doing, it's condensed to like a 60 plus ish mile radius Mm -hmm. where you're doing all those hills condensed in that period of time. And people really underestimate, you don't get to those hills fresh. It's not just those like, yes, they have the, they all in the three sisters, the three bitches, whatever you want to call them. The whole fucking hills uh, course is hilly. Okay. So like, it's not like, it's not like you get pancake flat and you got these three, you know, mountainous ranges you got to go over it is, it's the course and we've referenced the time it is, mm-hmm. it's, it's your body shot course. Mm-hmm. It yeah. is, it is always taking a body shot. It's not trying to knock you out in the first round. It's not trying to knock you out in the 12th. It's just going to keep giving you body shots, body shots, body shots. And if you're not trying to block them, you're going to, by this, by the eighth round or mile 80, you're going to get knocked out. Right. Because Again, it's one of those courses we've always joked this when we when we do the the go over the race profile and the the bike courses. Like people will look at the profile and like, ah, oh, so let's see, I got it. It's gonna make it basically make it ninety miles and it's all the way downhill after that. I right, got this. Right. And you're like, dude, no. Like you you still got two solid hills. You got the slower <laughs> bike path, you're heading back into town. The roads aren't always the, you know, the most the most awesome. And more 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 times than not you got a headwind <laughs> and, and there's nothing more. We did like a, I think a poll on, on Instagram a few weeks ago. that was like, would you rather have hills on the bike or a headwind? Everyone said hills on the bike. Well, in Wisconsin, you might have both. Right. Yeah, so that's just like one of those things where you have to, and hopefully you've trained to wear your body and your legs. We do a lot of big gear work, a lot of surge work because no, do you want to, you know, hammer up and do zone four and so five up these hills? No, you're going to keep a zone two, zone three, spin up. But what you want your legs to be able to do is you want your legs to be able to absorb all those body shots. And we're not taking chips out of it. They're just kind of like fending them off. They're ricocheting, right? You want these hills to ricochet off your legs. You don't want to put dents in them, right? And that goes back to, you know, how people how people train. And so it is, it, it's a course where patience and perseverance rule the day um, because you may try to, and I also think, you know, it's funny because you watch from a, a mental and psychological standpoint, the first 20 miles, I wouldn't call them super fast, but they're fairly quick mm-hmm. uh, compared to the rest of the course. You can kind of slowly watch your pace kind of undulate, you know, within, you know, 0.3 to 0.5 miles an hour average through the first 80 to 90. And then it's funny because people always expect them to be able to pick up the pace and see their miles per hour gain the last, you know, 10 to 20. But what you don't figure out is that you're a you're more fatigued, right? You've been on the course for a hundred, you know, 95 miles of an average overall time, overall time and speed. Even when we got about, we've got less than 20 left. So no matter how fast you think you're going to go, you're, you might gain like 0.1 miles an hour, but you're also going into a headwind. You also still have hills. You also are fatigued. You also still have to run a full marathon and you still got the bike path. <laughs> so, you know, it's like you don't, if there was ever a course to take miles per hour off your, off your garment, off your, your watch, Make it that one. Make it that one. Just go execute an effort 
Um, I would also highly recommend it is one of, if not the only courses I've ever pre-ridden in terms of uh, gotten in a car and rode it. You and I did it, mm-hmm. which honestly I was like, mm, this doesn't feel as fun as I signed up for. Um, but <laughs> yeah. it, it is one of those because of how technical it is. You want to know where you can keep the speed, where you need to be ready for a technical turn. Cause yes, while there are some really solid cruising downhills where you can make some time off and really rest your legs because the speed you'd get by pushing on the pedals basically will be negated by, you know, just being able to rest them. Uh, and it's not, it's not worth the ROI. Some of them you can get some speed on some of them skirt. You gotta be ready to take a right, ready to take a left and then not just take a right, but break right back up a hill again. And it, it's just, you're, you're always, you take, it's like, uh, it's like boxing and chess, right? You're, you're taking body shots and then you have to be shifting and, and, and playing this piece, not for the next piece or the next move, but for the next move and for this move and this move. So you can't just think about the moment you're in, you know, on, on flat courses or barely rolling courses, you're just in your moment, keeping it, keeping it, keep being steady. You don't have to think too much. You can just kind of get, you know, go off to la la land, hold your power, hold your cadence. Everything's the same. You might not gear for 10 miles. This course I mean, you might get carpal tunnel just from how many times you have to change gears. I mean, yeah. th- th- that's how many, that's how many times you change gears in the spike course. So be prepared for it, um, embrace it and, and don't expect, you know, to do anything earth shattering, but be prepared to be, you know, persistent, patient, and then get ready to have a fantastic run. Yeah. That's an interesting part about the gearing. Cause usually at the end of the second loop, my, when I'm shifting, my wrists are just kind of fried, you know, from the, yeah. And I I really, I'm like, oh, this is brutal. You know, I don't have electronic shifting. So I'm just usually up there kind of going, oh man, I'm leaning out, trying to crank it back or whatever. And uh, one thing I want to say about, again, about the the three bitches that I've, I've done it a lot and it never really occurred to me, but the first one um, is the long, there's three, one's long, one's kind of short and punchy. And then the third one is about medium. But the first one is, is, uh, a really kind of a longer climb and it takes a while, obviously a lot of patience to get up there. And, but the second one is almost right after it. So once you get to the top of that first, is it stagecoach? Um, mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. You get this top of stagecoach and then you're, um, then you kind of think, all right, I got, but then you're right into the, I guess it's old sock pass or right before timber lane that that one comes next and it's short, but it's a little steeper. So I would highly recommend once you get up that first one to kind of get your bearings and get everything ready. And then the minute you turn the right corner, um, you're going to be back into the second one. Then you're on Timberlane and you got kind of a break. Although that road has one of those, it has a nice pavement, but it's got those clunker, you know, ta-tum, ta-tum, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. I noticed that last time we were up there, I was like, man, this is really jarring. So um, I don't know if try and find a good, good, uh, lane on that to get away from some of those bumps but then you got that huge downhill right after that at the end of timber before you go into the third one which is the medium one which is the one where there's the most people cheering so that always helps to get you up that and then after that you're kind of downhill back into verona and then you're set up for the second loop and that is all pretty fast and flat through there until you get back to i guess where special needs is and that's basically the beginning of the second loop so just beware that second um, hill there on uh, timber, old sock, old sock or timber, whatever it is, and uh, take a little break after that first climb, man. Regroup it. Regroup it. Head back to town. Come back on the same bike path. Head right back up, as if there weren't enough hills. You got to bike your ass right back up the damn helix. Yeah, it's like <laughs> that's not it's, that it's bad like, though. <laughs> it's kind of it's you're kind of like really, really like I. I I had to run up it on the swim. I got to bike up it. Like, why don't you just make the finish line on top of the terrace and transition here? And I got to go up it again when I finish the marathon. You go right back up the helix, get off your bike, head back into the into the ballroom, change, come out. This is one of my, if not my favorite, run courses on the planet. However, having said that, you can absolutely blow your load the first two miles because there are so many people out. It is, you got some straightaways, you got a little bit of a, of a kind of a downhill. It was on East Main or Carroll Street coming out and it's a long straightaway. People are just jamming and you're like, I got this, man. You're flying. I mean, I oh, did yeah. it. I was flying the first like six, seven months. I was just, I was loving. There's so many there people everywhere. It's flat out, straight up concrete. Okay. It starts again. 
it's not a super hilly course, but after you've done that bike course, your legs, they got a little bit, they're a little bit jelly, right? They, they're a little bit softer. They're a little, uh, you know, they got some dents in them from the bike ride, no matter what, no matter what kind of cyclist you are. Um, but it, I'll tell you what, this course, it is very, very easy to get hyped out of the gate. You come out, you see the Capitol, you run down Main Street, Carroll Street, you are just feeling good. And that's where you usually see the, 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 the most, con, uh, it's the most condensed with people. Um, cause you get people coming in and get people going out. Um, there's just a lot of foot traffic, a lot of spectators, a lot of racers, and you can get really, really caught up in what you want to do and the energy around you versus what you need to do. And, and I can't encourage you enough to take these first two miles and just enjoy the crowds, enjoy the spectators, you know, enjoy the environment, but much like we talked about on the bike course, you know, being on the starting off on the bike path, relax, right? Relax, get your butt, get your body ready, get some extra fluids in you, see how you're feeling and then get ready to kind of address things. I, I always tell our athletes, like once you get out to the trail, you don't need to think about really honestly analyzing how you honestly feel until you get onto the trail by the lake. Because that, to me, that's when it gets quiet. Yes, there's some people around, but it's usually quiet, right? It's shaded. The more you can distance yourself from, I don't want to call it false energy, right? But, you know, you got the endorphin rush. You got your, you know, um, everything's kind of kicking in. You're getting kind of a spectator buzz. You might not be feeling how you're really feeling. But when you get out and you run along the water and you dead right there into the... Um, Right there by campus, and that's the library's right there. And then you take a left onto the trail. There's not much out there, right? You got the dorms on the left, you got the lake on the right. I think that's a really great place to now start. It's what mile, like mile five, six. You get out there, and that's when you can start. You know what? All right, now I'm feeling this. Now I'm feeling that. All right, now get in my zone, and then figure out now that you're now that you've clicked through the first 10 K and you're ready for, you know, your 20 miles. How can I attack this? How am I reasonably feeling and how do I foresee the rest of my race going? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Because that's uh really, it's actually about mile six, six or seven out there when you start that. And, but mile five is what you need to be really thinking about too. It's like, cause you're saying it really is. It's one of those situations where you definitely are probably going faster than you want to go out of the gate. You know, it's a, it's a feel thing. Like we were talking about when you feel really good, just start pulling back a little bit or easing back, I guess is the best, best way to say it. It's sort of like the swim. You're going to come out normally hot on that run. And then mm -hmm. by the time you get to mile yep. five, that's really the challenging part of the course. There's like the three hills that's the observatory. And there, I, I, I think there's three, the first one's the bigger one. And then there's kind of a dip and then you go back up again and then you go down and then you come up again. And then you have like a pretty steep downhill curve back to the right to get to the bottom of state street. And then you go up that, which is a slight grade. And then you come down it and that's a perfect running grade. So I always get sucked into that one too, but then you hit the trail and that's right around six or so. But I agree with you a hundred percent, man. You just, just be, you know, ready at mile five to kind of have your shit together for some climbing, because that's really the main section of Hills on that course is probably mm -hmm. a half mile or so, or a little more maybe of Hills. And then after that, yep. it's pretty, it's pretty chill for the most part. I mean, other than coming out of Camp Randall, there's a little pincher and there's another hill going back right around Camp Randall. But for the most part, it's pretty flat after, you know, before and after those, that hill section. So that's a good idea. Just, you know, ease, you know, ease your way through that hill section for the first time, get back over the, the running path. And, and again, ignore the uh, college kids running past you at like, mock speed and you're like shit these guys are Dude, crushing it's the me. worst it's yeah. the it's the worst it is the first year i did it i had no idea what was what was going on i was feeling pretty good out there cruising obviously still running a little bit too hot here comes he's like three chicks running behind me decked out in lululemon you know listening to you know alicia keys flying by me yeah. like they were like i was standing still and i'm like what Wait. oh just you know college kids who you know <laughs> they're just joggers 
just out jogging, man. <laughs> they're, just out, they're just out jogging. I'm already red face, sweating through them. Arms are all crusty with salt. I'm like, man, must be great. You know, I mean, like, oh, look at that old guy. He's doing the, he's doing an Iron Man. Uh, you know, it's, it, I, I love how the, how it's, um, it's split up, how the course, but I do think that that uh, area, um, with the pen, especially around observatory, it, it can, it can eat your lunch. Um, and, and you see, that's where I am my experience doing it and my experience spectating. That's where you see the majority of people taking walk breaks, um, is on that backside. It's a it's lonely just, it, it can't, place. <laughs> yes, it is super lonely. And, and also like that, that stretch out by the lake that I, I really actually like, it is softer. It's harder to move, but it's all, it, it goes on a lot longer than you think it does. Um, it, it, on the map, like oh, that's that's pretty quick turnaround. But once you get out there, you're pretty lonely. It it it's a good stretch. Um, mm-hmm. then you come back in, so it is, but it's broken up nice that way. And then you come back into town, and then uh, as most races are two loops, you got to run your ass right by the finishing line, um, and around the capital to see all the people that yell, "Hey, you're almost there! Hey, you're doing!" And you're like, "God, I got 13 miles left. This is gonna suck." Mm-hmm. But it, hopefully, at that point. You're still feeling like you know you got us. You're at a six or a seven. You're you're making it. Remember, it's not about how fast you go. It's about how little you slow down. Get your uh, get your um, special needs bag if you need it, um, and then head back out again on on the course and and pace it just the same. Right? It, it's all about execution. It's all about effort. Um, and again, the course is broken up so in, in such a spectacular fashion. I think that gives you a little bit of everything. Spectators, loneliness, change of uh, you know a little bit of change in terrain, change of surface. You know all the things I honestly kind of look for in a in a in a run course that kind of keep you on your toes, but also kind of keep keep the mood changing and the scenery changing. Um, it can I will say it can get quite cool depending on what the weather's like at night out there um, because you do have a lot of heavy shade. But if it's if it's going to be cool and you're going to be out there for a little bit later on in the day, um, it's it can get quite cold. Uh, it, last year, I think it really snuck up on people as the day got as the day got later. It got a lot colder than I think than I think people anticipated. You saw people in like the you know the astronaut you know plastic silver blankets you know on the run course. You know, it, it, listen, nothing wrong with throwing in an old school long sleeve tee or or some gloves or whatever it is you might need in a special needs bag that you're not you're not worried you're never going to get back. Uh, it's better to have than to have not because. You know, we've we've mentioned this on quite a few podcasts that people people rarely ever drop out of races because it's too hot, but people frequently drop out of races in DNF because it's too cold. Mm-hmm. And and why ah oh, well, you know, low fifties ain't that bad. Well, when you aren't when you're not able to move at a very quick pace because you're so effing exhausted, you can't do enough to keep your core temp high enough to warm yourself up. Right. So if people, oh, I'm running, I'm like, no, you, you, you're thinking of like running like you normally run, like when it's out hot, like, but if it's too cold and you're, you know, you're wearing a tri kit, right? You're not wearing long sleeve shirt and in tights, you know, getting your blood pumping and running, you know, at a faster speed, generating more heat, raising your core temp to keep yourself warm. You're doing the opposite. You're slower and you have less clothes on. People can't get quiet too. So make make yourself uh, make sure you're prepared. Um, the weather is usually perfect, but you, I have seen in the past people get um, pretty chilly on the back half of that run course. Yeah, for sure. What do you think about? I can't remember what you think about running through the stadium. I think it's a fucking waste of time. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, I, I, I kind of I mean, do too, but. Know, I, I mean, I'm a football guy. It's it, to me, it's like you know, hey, old school. I'm like, hey, run by Churchill Downs. Really, never saw it. Okay, mm-hmm. never saw it once. Like, it's just you, you detour inside. And they're just like these little annoying ass, like little like minor hills that you have to go. That you have to go up and down to get in in and out of the uh, stadium. Mm-hmm. And you're like, this is not what I need in my life right now. I don't. Yeah. Need, I don't need these. You know, at that point, a speed bump seems like Mount Everest, but like, I don't need to see the inside of this stadium that probably just got used the day before that hasn't been cleaned yet. It's got rats and smells like shit. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I don't, I don't need to, to mosey around. I don't, I don't need any more e- uh, east west movement <laughs> that I've already had. I'm just trying to make it forward. Uh, no, I, I don't think it's cool at all. Um, but then again, if it was going through Neyland Stadium in Tennessee, I probably think it was cool, yeah. you know, so I, it, it's, but I, I think it's a momentum killer to be honest with you. Cause you, it, it's just 
not I, I get it it makes sense it's in madison you you run by the course or you run by the field in the stadium i get i get the idea i get the sentiment but i do think it's a massive momentum killer um from the long stretch you had right before it and the pretty decent long stretch you have after it mm. <clears throat> yeah i agree i mean i like it too i wish they would um do something more with it like pump in highlights from like, years seriously gone by. like pump up the uh, jams man like jump around you know just do something that really kind of fits the stadium and uh like highlights from big plays in history or i don't know just something like that but i think i was one year i did it and i know like i think the football team is up there and they have like a study area up in the boxes or something and some of the guys were tweeting about it i thought that was kind of cool that they're you know so you know the football team's up there supporting you but they can't you can't hear them because they're behind glass and they sure are silly and studying. Um, <laughs> and then you come, come and then you come back through, and uh, you come back down to again one of my favorite finishing lines uh, back around the Capitol, um, and down to the finish line. It's a great place, especially at night. It's just spectacular. The whole Capitol's lit up. It's a special place. It's a special course. Uh, so get out there and enjoy yourself. Uh, execute. Don't get so caught up in in the small things. Um, a couple couple uh, tips for spectators, since I've spectated a ton, coached a lot. Food's hard to come by, unfortunately. Food is a little bit hard to come by later in the day. Uh, so if you need food, order it early or pack some from the hotel. But uh, find a good spot in the course. Make sure you got enough food. Uh, again, make sure you got enough clothes, too, because it can get hot and get cold again. Um, plenty of great choices. Plenty of great uh, um opportunities to spectate make sure you get down there for the swim start i'm not a guy that goes out in the bike course ever and nor will i ever do it uh but sit back relax and feel yourself get a good breakfast or a brunch and you know everyone's out there on the course and get ready for them to come back especially with the pro field you'll see them coming and flying through uh it should be a jam-packed day and, and as always weather's pretty much spot on in, in madison so uh prepare i'll be interested to see what the what the spectatorship is like the day before as someone uh, participating in the 70.3 um what it's what's going to be like obviously the the run course you're not you're not you're not sharing the course again like you did last year with the full you're you're doing a totally different bike course uh, I think uh, very similar to the one they did in 19 and then you're doing the lake loop, which from what I understand from the athletes that we have that live there is, is a beautiful loop, a challenging loop, but a beautiful loop. Uh, it's a 13.1 around the lake. So that's, I'm a huge water guy. So, Hey, I, I figure utilize it. Um, and honestly, again, just more, just more to be said to a city who's allowing two races on back-to-back days to happen, right? Versus a lot of other cities that just bitch and moan about the events still happening in their city, even though it brings millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, in revenue to, uh, especially the hospitality industry. So, uh, yeah, it's gonna be a great weekend. We look forward to seeing uh, everyone there, and we hope you have found this race preview podcast beneficial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've run that Lake Loop. And it is not, most of it, it actually, you know, I know you love lakes, but it, most of it probably won't be on the lake. A lot of it's back through a neighborhood, which is really cool. Yeah, that's, that's a what cool reading. Yeah. I think it goes uh, clockwise. If somebody was telling me it goes clockwise, which is um, the opposite way that I ran. But I think uh, the hills are going to be back in the neighborhood and I don't think they're anything massive or anything like that, but. It's a cool, it's really cool like, back there. I, I mean, like there's some awesome houses. I feel houses. like it's counterclockwise. I feel like it, it, the last time I looked at the course map, I think it actually goes out towards, um, the, like towards a swim start. As it goes to go begin. Past the bike shop first and they go that way, I think. I think, well, the thing, the good thing about that loop is that it is always like packed. So those people back in there, they might come out and support that. I doubt the, the bike course because nobody really knows where it is. I don't think that. I don't know how much support yeah, would be yeah. out that I'm way. Gonna, and it goes out towards Stoughton, cheering. which is yeah, south. Of course. But yeah, I wouldn't anticipate that. But I think the neighborhood back there will probably have a lot of people gathering and getting behind the whole thing. Well, that'll be nice. I look forward to do a little race recap of that. Um, no, you're right. It does go counterclockwise. Yep, it comes Counter? out and goes left. Oh. Yep, it goes counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. Oh, okay. Yep. So you have a nice... Yeah, so you head, out, head out towards a swim start. Yep. Okay. Interesting. 
Yeah. Well, I'll let everybody know how it is after you know, head out towards Adwood Avenue to start in that park. But yeah, it looks like it's mostly up in like, you know, suburbia. Uh, but from everything I've read, it's a pretty awesome, a pretty awesome loop. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we'll give an, I'll give a nice little recap of that uh, the week after, but that's it. Um, again, if you're up there, say hi to us. I'll be racing 70.3. Mike's doing the full. I'll be out there spectating uh, the next day after my 70.3. Uh, Grand and I can walk around. Uh, and I'm not just totally destroyed, uh, but come say hi to us. We'll be around Thursday and Friday for sure. If you see us, definitely stop us, say hello, uh, get your selfie with Mike. Um, and we look forward to uh, an awesome weekend there. As always, just go to our website, c26triathlon.com. It's our one-stop shop for all things coaching, camps, and community. If you're looking for coaching or just general help with your uh, off-season or next year, hit us up. Look at the coaching tab. Find the coach that's right for you. Reach out to us. And then if you need anything from Mike, uh, you can get a, a, a hold of him. He is available at crushingiron at gmail.com. If you need anything from me specifically, I'm at c26coach at gmail.com. So I can't expect you out there at one of the big hills, huh? Supporting me, slapping me on the back as I ride up. On, on the bike course? On the bike, yeah. No. <laughs> no chance. No, I'll be, <laughs> no, not a chance, dude. <laughs> this is like your 19th rodeo. I'm not going to be out there. <laughs> Hell no, man. I'll be in my hotel room, in my boots, trying to get my legs under me so I can be out there cheering you on when you come in off the bike. No, I, I know my strengths, and that's not one of them. Yeah. No, I'm with you, man. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, we'll see you guys in Madison. All right, buddy. I'll see you. See you,